I'm uh, delighted to be able to introduce our uh, special guest today, Dr. Frank Salome from Boston College. Uh, we've known Frank for uh, some years, especially as we have co-hosted with him uh, a series of events on the future of religious minorities in the Middle East at Boston College, where he's been most helpful and we've collaborated in having a very good program uh, there. Um, Frank is currently the chair of the um, Department of Slavic and Eastern Languages and Literature at Boston College. He did his PhD at Brandeis University, and he's a specialist in uh, national identity questions in, in uh, Lebanon, Syria, the broader Levant. Uh, he's a very distinguished scholar. His most recent book, which was only published about a year ago, um, is a biography of Charles Korm, one of the early uh, Lebanese nationalists, one of the formative thinkers, one of the formative producers of modern Lebanese nationalism, uh, who looked for inspiration as far back as the Phoenicians. And, um, it's a very well-received book, and we're very delighted to have Frank here, not just because he's a, um, a scholar, but he has traveled extensively in the region. He's been to Israel and to the Palestinian territories and has seen something of the realities there for himself, and he will share his font of knowledge with us this evening. Thanks so much for coming, Frank. Thank you. Fount of knowledge, I don't know. Uh, Dr. Eibner, thank you very much. John, thank you for uh, your very generous uh, introduction. It uh, made, me, made me think I wish my mother and father were here to see all of the nice things being said about me. Uh, my, my father would have been proud, my mother would have believed it. Uh, uh, so, and, uh, speaking of mothers and fathers, um, I always thought that my parents had property here in Switzerland uh, because as, as a child, uh, they would tell us, if you do well in school this year, next Christmas we'll take you skiing in Switzerland. Of course, I never did well in school and I never saw Switzerland until now. Um, but I did grow up skiing on Mount Lebanon, and as things go in the Middle East, it's a pretty impressive thing uh, to do, especially when you think from a Western perspective, you think about the Middle East, you have a certain image of it. Uh, to say that uh, you ski on Mount Lebanon and we have snow into June, uh, it's quite impressive. And you don't have to travel far in Lebanon, it's, it's very close distance-wise. At any rate, um, uh, Lebanese of my parents and my, my teacher's uh, generation uh, always thought of Lebanon as the Switzerland of the Middle East um, and um, always made sure that we, the, the kids, were aware of that and, and bragged about it. Um, and I guess so, the reason why I'm saying this is because I think that had I been born under a luckier star, I would have been able to tell you how proud and delighted I am to be here in the Lebanon of Europe. Uh, but I guess you won't understand the, the analogy. Uh, so I'll just console myself and tell you that I was born um, in a place that all things being relative, uh, in many ways resembles Switzerland. Um, in its topology, in its exiguous territory, in its mountainous terrain, in its ski resorts, believe it or not, in its forgiving climate, in its uh, liberal mores, in its it laissez-faire economic systems, in its bank secrecy laws. But most importantly, Lebanon resembles uh, Switzerland in the diversity uh, of its people. Um, a Mediterranean port city that is also a, a mountain when you, you have over 18 different uh, ethno-religious groups duking it out every 25 years over influence. 
I'm not saying that it happens here, but that's, that's Lebanon. It's, it's a combination of people who pay tribute to, to Arab nationalism, meeting, uh, meeting their equals and people who think of themselves as a piece of Europe uh, at the foot of a splendid mountain and who savor the language of French, uh, France as if, as if it were uh, their own. <coughs> Um, indeed, what may be referred to elsewhere in the world as uh, ethnic national groups are in Lebanon and in the Near East uh, defined in religious terms. After all, this is how 14 centuries of Islam has taught Middle Easterners to refer to themselves rather than by ethnicity, by religious belonging. And so, in speaking of Near Eastern Christians today, and without diminishing the very important religious aspects of their identities as faith communities, I should like to frame the conversation about Holy Land uh, Christians uh, in terms of ethnic groups defined religiously, rather than religious denominations or faith communities, strictly speaking. This is so in order to uh, avoid that the individuality of what amounts essentially to pre-modern national churches uh, be reduced to purely religious attributes. And that is the main reason behind, uh, I have a grisly subtitle of uh, this, this paper, I titled it The Semantics of Ideological Necrophilia. Um, to be clear, the ideological necrophilia uh, that I mentioned uh, refers to certain attractions to dead ideas uh, and their semantics, obsolete terminologies that we in the West have come to normalize and valorize and privilege in reference to the Near East and the peoples of the Near East, and especially the Christians of uh, the Holy Land. And so, before tackling the topic at hand, the Christians of the Holy Land, it may prove useful to unpack some of those long-standing terminologies and parse them out a bit and suggest some discipline in the taxonomy about things and peoples and events and places pertaining to the Near East. In the context of modern uh, Near and Middle Eastern history, seldom are the varied peoples of the region viewed beyond oversimplified, often reductive, notions of Arab and Muslim to the neglect of other pre-Arab and pre-Muslim Near Eastern First Nations. Um, otherwise, people who have lapsed from uh, the prevalent paradigms and conversations on, of, and about uh, the Near and Middle East. Indeed, a century or more of Western academic interest in this region has yielded precious little beyond cliches and assumptions beholden exclusively to Arabs, Arab fears, Arab hopes, Arab concerns, Arab hang-ups, the emblematic be-all and all of all matters Middle East. Yet, I suggest to you that there exists a vibrant, venerable, authentic Near East past these dominant platitudes. To this point, the uh, Brill Encyclopedia of Arabic Language and Linguistics noted that the seventh century Arab conquests and colonization of a heretofore non-Arab Near East never wholly Arabized nor Islamized the new colonial chattel. Some peoples of the Near and Middle East resisted Arabization and Islamization. Quote, even among those who underwent both these processes, this was not always accompanied by a total abandonment of their earlier culture. Thus, there are still pockets across the so-called Arab world using languages other than Arabic and practicing religions other than Islam. And there are still Near Eastern people today convinced that their ancestors belonged to a people different from the Arab and Muslim people." End quote. Yet, traditional Middle East scholarship remains largely mute on this topic, unsuitable as it may be deemed in some quarters to need normative Arab models or uh, strictly or legitimately Muslim uh, molds. So it is within this context that this paper suggests the prevalent assumptions about an essentially Arab or a uniformly 
Muslim Near East be confronted. And it is within this framework that the Christians of the Holy Land ought to be examined. Historian Joel Mar uh, Carmichael noted in this regard that, in another quote, he noted that it was in fact a Western habit of referring to Arabic-speaking Muslims as Arabs because of their language on the analogy of French speakers as Frenchmen and German speakers as German, etc. It was this Western habit that imposed itself on a Near East that had never regarded language as a basic social classifier. It was natural for Europeans to use the word Arab about a Muslim whose native language was Arabic. They were quite indifferent to the principles of classification in the East. The oddity here is simply that this European habit became the very germ upon which the contemporary Arab nationalist idea was built." End quote. Even some of the main avatars of Arab nationalist ideology admitted this reality. Uh, a fellow by the name of Sata al-Husri, who is the, uh, the father of modern linguistic Arab nationalism, um, who was intransigent in his advocacy as to who is an Arab. One of his m favorite adages was that, you're an Arab if I say so, period. Uh, Yet, in spite of his intransigence, Husri admitted that the idea of a uniform, unified, coherent Arab nation um, had its origins in fiction. He admitted that it was born uh, from the ambitious, ambitions of Europeanized nationalist dreamers and thinkers. Bernard Lewis, who is considered by many the doyen uh, of modern Middle Eastern and Islamic history, <clears throat> also underscored the newness of the term Arab as one lending itself to confusion and anachronisms uh, when dealing with the modern Near East. Um, Arab as a national classifier is a novel phenomenon, noted Lewis, the outcome of 20th century Arab nationalist doctrine ascribed willy-nilly and posthumously to pre-Arab Near Eastern peoples defined by other systems of social classification, often anteceding Arabs and Muslims and modern Arabist and Arab nationalist and Islamist discourse. In sum, ethnic terms by uh, definition are notoriously difficult to uh, define, and Arab is certainly not among uh, the easiest. If the identifying factor in identity formation is language, then one wonders if an Arabic-speaking Jew from Iraq or an Arabic-speaking Christian from Lebanon uh, or Egypt can be deemed an Arab without oversimplifying uh, and misleading. I think here in, in, in uh, Switzerland, you would understand that analogy. Um, I don't think that a uh, French-speaking Swiss can be considered a Frenchman. Um, that's, that's where I'm going with this. Uh, and that is why the term uh, Arab Christian in reference to Near Eastern Christians often causes unease. Not because it's problematic, and I submit to you that it's profoundly problematic, but it causes unease mainly because it lacks accuracy. What one means by Arab Christian, or for that matter, Arab Jew, ultimately answers to a political rather than an ethnic or a cultural or a historical question. It remains the case that not all, not even most Arabic speaking Near Eastern Christians and Jews can be deemed Arab. Indeed, most of them reject that label out of hand, and many of them from my part of the world would take great umbrage at being folded within uh, that category. And so, for the sake of countering these misleading semantics, what I call the semantics of ideological necrophilia, I propose that the term uh, Arab Christian be used with extreme caution, if used at all. It is worth mentioning in this regard that a medievalist's and a modernist's conception of what an Arab Christian is are two different views, two widely distant uh, time periods. Um, an Arab Christian in pre-modern times, that is uh, before the emergence of Arab nationalism in the early 20th century, an Arab Christian was somebody from the Arabian Peninsula 
who happened to be a Christian. Now, those Christians of the Arabian Peninsula, or Arab Christians, if you prefer, were all but decimated with the coming of Islam, either uh, through conversion, uh, mass exodus, or uh, by succumbing to the sword. And this is mainly why there are no native Arab Christians in today's Yemen or Saudi. There are, of course, Christians, but no native Christians, in, uh, generally speaking, uh, in, the, in the Persian Gulf. Ironically, the only Near Eastern Christians today who claim Arab descent are the Greek Orthodox, whom we call in Arabic Rum Orthodox. I don't, you, it doesn't need a translation. Rum Orthodox means Orthodox Romans. Um, so uh, I don't know if it's uh, irony, disorientation, or, or humor. Uh, but certainly those Arabophone Christians who claim to be Arabs have every right to make that claim, whether it's historically tenable or not. But by the same token, those Arabophone Christians who make the claim that they are not Arabs should also uh, uh, have the prerogative to, to, to say so. Still, Arab Christian, to mean Near Eastern Christians in Toto, is a term that is anachronistic and misleading. It's a medievalist tool, a reference to a pre-Islamic Arabian, Arabian ethnos that no longer exists, the outcome of European, not Arab, systems of social classification, and in that case, not a particularly uh, informative or helpful classifier when it comes to the mosaics of identities that are the Near and Middle East. So, I suggest that the common and ultimately more accurate and ideologically neutral terms in reference to Near Eastern uh, Christians um, be Near Eastern Christians, or Oriental Christians, or Levantine Christians, or as they say in, um, in the language of Descartes, which is a very precise language, the French language, they call them Chrétiens d'Orient, Christians of the Near East. Better yet, what I suggest we do is start using these people's own self-classifiers, the way they refer to themselves, as Copts, Chaldeans, Maronites, Greek Orthodox. Those are the names by which they went for centuries. Those are the names by which they describe themselves. Those are the names by which you, you read their literature. Um, and incidentally, 18th and 19th century French voyageurs, travelers, diplomats, writers, authors, etc., who traveled to the East, referred to these people as la race maronite, la race copte, la race chaldeenne. It's, it doesn't need translation, but, but you have to take into consideration that in 19th, 19th century parlance, race meant uh, uh, nation, right? In the ethnicity in the sense of a nation. So those are terms that these people use to refer to themselves. Um, otherwise, uh, the term uh, Arab Christian, again, remains a modern device, the outcome of Arab nationalist chauvinism, and in that sense, a novel phenomenon and a misleading cognomen when applied to Near Eastern uh, Christians en masse. And this brings me to the topic at hand, Palestine, Israel, and the Christians of disputed holy lands. Here too, allow me again to say a few words on taxonomy, uh, because not unlike the terms Arab and Arab Christians, so are the terms uh, Palestine and Palestinians to mean exclusively the Arabic speaking people of British Mandate Palestine, so are those terms defective and misleading. Even at the outset of the Middle East's nationalist era, um, during the early 20th century, those terms have confounded scholars, travelers, and indigenous uh, Near Easterners. In the late 19th century, long before the passions of Arab nationalism had come to dominate historical writing on the Near East, French anarchist uh, historian Élisée Reclus noted that, quote, the populations of Syria and Palestine alleged to be Arab by some scarcely warrant this appellation. 
a designation justified only by way of an abusive labeling of spoken dialects as Arabic. Otherwise, these populations issue from the ancient inhabitants of the region, and the conquerors erupting from Arabia were never able to stamp out the indigenous cultures of Syria and Palestine." End quote. And so observers, analysts, uh, historians, and students of the Near East are not on shaky historical ground, uh, calling for caution in the use of demonyms and place names relative to the Holy Land. The terms Palestinian and Palestine in reference to Arabs exclusively, just like the term Arab itself, uh, are novel uh, phenomena. Indeed, prior to the establishment of the British Mandate, what is today Palestine, geographically and conceptually speaking, belonged to the vilayets, that is to say the Ottoman states of Beirut and Damascus, and to the Sanjak, which is an autonomous uh, province of Jerusalem. So in that sense, today's term Palestinian has no discrete national meaning, uh, or had no discrete, na it does today have a discrete national meaning, but in the pre-modern era, it did not have a discrete uh, national meaning, at least uh, uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, and it was indistinguishable from other references to localities like Beiruti, Damascene, and Aleppin, and so forth. And so the, Palestine is an exclusively European geographic term, similar to the way in Europe we would say New England or the Alps or the Mediterranean. Again, a very sort of elastic geographic term with no national connotations, not even, not even um, administrative connotations. So up until 1964, and I would argue until 1967, the national consciousness of the Arab-defined inhabitants of what is today Israel and the territories of the Palestinian Authority was delineated by way of local, familial, religious, and tribal loyalties, not a distinct Palestinian nationhood to mean, especially not to mean Arab. Palestine and Palestinian certainly refer to a well-defined toponym and demonym today, that is the Arabs of what was once British Mandate Palestine. However, the term Palestine itself is again of Western European, not Arab provenance, and it refers to the Holy Lands from a modern Christian perspective as the home of Christians and Jews usurped by Arabs and Muslims in earlier times. Indeed, only 20th century Jews and Christians imbued as they were with Western ideas and Western languages, only they referred to themselves as Palestinians during the British Mandate era. So I'm talking between 1920 to 1947. Uh, with the Muslims largely shunning uh, that term and opting for earlier Ottoman labels, religious labels in the main. And so, it was when the Jews of British Mandate Palestine relinquished the term Palestinian in favor of Israeli, only then did Arabs and Muslims begin warming to the term Palestinian, eventually espousing it as their new national moniker only around the, the mid-1960s, when it becomes more clear. Note in this regard that the predecessor of today's Jerusalem Post, which is uh, one of the Jewish daily publications, was founded in British Mandate Palestine in 1925 by Jewish intellectuals, and it was founded under the name of the Palestine Bulletin. Okay? In 1933, it changed its name to the Palestine Post. In 1950, it changed its name a third time into the Jerusalem Post. Okay, so this was a time when Palestine and Palestinian were becoming gradually uh, more acceptable in some Arab quarters, and I stress some. Otherwise, the term Palestinian up until the late 1950s was generic, not national, European, not Arab, and a reference to all inhabitants of British Mandate Palestine, Jews, and Christians first and foremost, Muslims, or rather some Muslims in later times. 
except among members of the Arabophone Christian and Jewish educated elites of Beirut, Jerusalem, Haifa, and Damascus, there exists today, from that era, no Arabic language documents, no local Arabic language press from the early 1900s, no local Arabic literature, and no Arabic language private or consular correspondence referring to the Holy Land as Palestine or to its Muslim inhabitants as Palestinians. Case in point is that the Arab Palestinians calls to arm to the Zionist project, the Zionist assault, if you will, which was a nationalist assault, throughout the mandate period, their response was religious, not national. Um, the higher Arab committee was mainly a Muslim committee. The Muslim Supreme Council was, as the name designates, Muslim Supreme Council. And the main two figures in the, what today, retroactively, we call the Palestinian National Movement, the two main figures of that movement were the Hajj Amin al-Husseini, Hajj Amin al-Husseini, and um, a uh, Damascene Sunni preacher, Azzedin al-Qassam, who is the hero today of the Hamas movement, uh, n neither of whom can be credited with engaging uh, a distinctly Palestinian national discourse. And therein lies the quandary of the Christians of the Holy Land today, torn as they are uh, between exile, disintegration, integration, and having to pay lip service uh, to a declining Arabism on the one hand and a resurgent Islamism on the other hand. Unlike other uh, Near Eastern Christians whose fortunes have vacillated between assertiveness, some even say conceit, as is the case with the Maronites of Lebanon, and submissiveness, dimitude, as is the case with the Copts of Egypt, the Christians of the Holy Land are marginal at best. They're marginal politically and culturally, they're marginal socially, they're marginal in the larger Arab and Israeli communities housing them. They are marginal numerically speaking and in comparison to other uh, Near Eastern Christian groups. And ultimately they are margin marginal, I would say even negligible in the larger context of Christianity and Christendom as a whole. But marginal as they may be, they are of critical importance. Otherwise, I would have no paper to present today. They are of critical importance, and their importance is in the cautionary tale that they, uh, that they present, the cautionary tale that their dissolution the uh, offers, the food for thought, as it were, for the rest of the Middle East and Near Eastern Christians, and indeed for Christendom as a whole, and what may be lurking in the future of both Near Eastern and Western Christendom. Even though they might have been the first nation of Christendom rooted in Christianity's birthplace and at the very center of Christian thought, Christian culture, Christian literature, Christian, Christian theology, and indeed Christian civilization, the Christians of the Holy Land are today a mere shadow, not to say a specter of their pre-Muslim conquest existence. Barely 2% the total population of Israel and the Palestinian territories today, which is to say roughly 160,000 Christians in Israel proper and barely 40,000 Christians in the Palestinian uh, territories. Holy Land Christians uh, are caught in the crossfire of the Arab-Israeli conflict, alienated by Arabs for being Israeli citizens, they suffer restrictions as Arabs within Israel itself and prejudice as non-Muslims and therefore as suspects within an overwhelmingly Muslim and Islamized uh, Palestinian community. Beginning in the seventh century under Muslim rule, Christians of the Holy Land gradually uh, became a minority. Not right away, it took hundreds of years. But what is interesting is that they became a minority in their in their original homeland. They didn't come from Mars. Others came from Mars. 
Those are the indigenous. I, I hate using the term indigenous, but they are the indigenous Christians, okay? The first Christians. Um, through the exactions of dimitude, having to live as second-class citizens, the restrictions that the Muslim conquerors placed upon them, uh, over time uh, sort of emaciated them, sort of etiolated their numbers. Like other Christians of the Eastern Mediterranean, the position of Holy Land Christians witnessed a slight, albeit tenuous, improvement in the waning days of uh, the Ottoman Empire as Western missionaries took advantage of Ottoman decline in order to increase their social and pastoral and cultural presence, establishing new schools, new churches, hospitals, tending to the needs of Holy Land Christians, and setting into motion a process of modernization and urbanization and cultural renewal, cultural uh, revival. Um, A useful analogy to help us sort of grasp, there are 25 different, if Lebanon has 20, 18 different ethno-religious groups, uh, the Holy Land has about 25 Christian denominations. Okay, so it's a very diverse place. And again, try to think of denominations, not only in, in the sense of faith groups, think of them also as ethnic groups. Okay, and to give you a sense of how diverse this, play, this place is, usually I like to use the analogy of um, uh, the Passion of the Christ, who, the, the, the motion picture, not the actual Passion of the Christ. Who has seen the motion pi picture, the Passion of the Christ? Okay. So in that, in that production, um, um, uh, it, was, it was flaunted throughout that, that um, not Mel Brooks, Mel Gibson, um, uh, made his Jesus character speak Aramaic. Yes, that is true. But if you pay uh, close attention uh, to the language or the languages that go on in that motion picture, there are at least four languages. There is Aramaic. Jesus definitely speaks Aramaic. But there's also Hebrew. But there's also Latin. But there's also Greek. Okay. So... Um, like Arabic, Hebrew at the time was a ceremonial language. So it was the language of the priestly classes, and that's a language in which Jesus himself, coming from a priestly line, communicated uh, with the Jewish elites. Uh, Aramaic was the language of the commoners. It was a language of the Jews and the language of the, um, uh, the pagans. Uh, Greek was the language also, another language of uh, uh, the commoners. Latin was a language of the Roman legions and the administration. Uh, remember that the, uh, the Gospels were written in Greek. They were not written in English. They were not written in Aramaic. At least we don't have originals in Aramaic. Uh, they were in Greek. So that should tell you something about the linguistic situation, the linguistic diversity uh, of the time. Uh, this diversity in the time of Christ is still the same one that defines and distinguishes uh, the Eastern Mediterranean today, the Holy Land in particular. And this diversity has in turn been tolerated and suppressed and celebrated and maligned at different times with the consequent uh, changing fortunes of Holy Land Christians getting better or worse depending on the hegemon of the day. And I'm talking about hegemons here in the past only 14 centuries. As noted earlier, <coughs> The Arab Muslim conquests of the 7th century were traumatic to Near Eastern Christians in general, to Holy Land Christians in particular. The situation was somewhat tolerable uh, during the early Umayyad period, uh, between the 7th and mid 7th and mid 8th century, uh, because the Umayyads were consolidating uh, their hold on the newly conquered Byzantine world. They showed themselves to be more lenient vis-a-vis the Christian majority population. Yet, as they became more secure in their authority, their presence and their numbers uh, became less forgiving. Under Abbasid reign, which lasted from about 750 to 1250 AD, Muslim anti-Christian attitudes became an article of faith, instigating large-scale emigration, conversion, and overall victimization of Holy Land Christians. 
for instance, building of churches and visible displays of Christian symbols were forbidden. Uh, crosses that already figured uh, on church rooftops were forcibly removed. Uh, Christians were required to wear distinctive uh, garbs in public so as to be clearly identified and, and segregated, separated from the Muslim populace. Uh, homes of Christians had to be marked with a scarlet letter, uh, further ostracizing them and preventing them from coming into contact with uh, the righteous, uh, the Muslims, lest they be sullied by a Christian presence. Uh, there was a period of humanism, if we can use that term, and it's, it's uh, anachronistic, uh, but the often vaunted uh, humanism and enlightenment of a Basit Caliph, Harun al-Rashid, um, who ruled uh, into 809 or 810, um, the alleged friendship that he had with uh, Charlemagne, Charlemagne um, did not change uh, things much with regards to the status of Holy Land Christians. They still suffered uh, molestation and persecution and banishment and, and often death uh, under enlightened uh, Muslim rule. But by 801, 800, 801, Charlemagne had obtained a kind of a uh, uh, arrangement to ease the suffering of uh, Christians, and he used that opportunity in order to start rebuilding Christian homes and places of worship. Um, this uh, witnessed uh, the, um, the setting up of a Benedictine monastery very close to the uh, Church of the Holy Sepulchre, uh, soon to be followed by uh, a new church, a church of the Santa Maria Latina, erected uh, nearby, uh, housing a library uh, and also a, a Christian hospice. This uh, positive interlude uh, may indeed be curious um, in light of uh, Harun al-Rashid's continued molestation of his Christian subjects and Charlemagne's also avowed uh, hostility towards Muslims. How could they be friends, uh, right? Uh, but it's this very insecurity that is very important to, to the, the concept of limitude. Uh, insecurity and indeed uh, unpredictability were at the heart of the Christian's tenuous existence uh, in the East. I mean, when we talk about dimitude, the word dimmi in Arabic, it's often translated in, to Western languages into protection, the system of protection. But dimmi has a... I'm not going to say a million, I'm not a little kid, but it has dozens of uh, semantic connotations. Vimma in Arabic means accusation. Okay? So you can say the Vimmi are the, the protected people, but you can also say that they are the accused people. Um, and then the question of protection. Why protection? Why do you need protection? Protection against what? Against whom? So, just like you can say it's a system of protection, you can also say that it's a system of extortion. Uh, at any rate, with Harun al-Rashid's death in 809 AD, the degraded status uh, of Holy Land Christians would become more degrading, and the dhimma uh, would come uh, to be more strictly enforced. In time, all this led to increased forced conversions and a steady, I wouldn't say bleeding, but steady exodus of Holy Land Christians to neighboring Christian uh, territories not yet uh, under Muslim jurisdiction. But as Abbasid rule uh, waned and passed on to Turkic generals toward the middle of the 10th, uh, middle to end of the 10th uh, century, the fortunes of Holy Land Christians deteriorated even further. Uh, more of their places of worship were torched and desecrated. More of their dwelling places were destroyed. More demoralization and dread ensued and gripped their societies. And by the end of the 10th century, uh, the Holy Land and indeed the entire uh, uh, Eastern Mediterranean would be passed on to the Fatimid uh, dynasty uh, of Egypt. Under the most infamous uh, 
of the Fatimids, the Caliph al-Hakim, from about the, the end of the 10th century to the uh, early two decades of the 11th century. Under al-Hakim, um, Christian pilgrimage to the Holy Land was altogether banned. Whatever crosses were left or forgotten on top of remaining uh, houses of worship uh, were burned. Hundreds of places of worship were destroyed and pillaged, demolished. Among them, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And, curiously enough, on those that remained, small mosques began cropping up on the roofs of those remaining churches. Um, a very significant, curious spectacle if you're walking by, but, it, but it's a very significant one, and it, it, it demonstrates the, uh, those places were not destroyed on purpose. They had little mosques built on top of them to demonstrate the superiority uh, of the ruler. Um, and this precipitated uh, further uh, rising waves of uh, Christian conversion and emigration. Now, oddly enough, Al-Hakim was an odd character, um, and, and this also speaks to the muddy, frightening uh, nature of the Dimma system itself, the, the, again, the insecurity. Uh, toward the end of his reign, Al-Hakim allowed many Christians or Christian converts to Islam to return to their original Christian faith. That, that is to say, to convert out of Islam back uh, to Christianity. Um, and uh, he allowed them to return and play, pray on the remnants of uh, the Holy Sepulcher. And this is an act otherwise punishable uh, by death under Islamic law. Indeed, Al-Hakim's uh, Fatimid successors uh, allowed the Holy Sepulcher itself to be, uh, to be rebuilt. So that by the time the first Crusades arrived in 1099 AD, uh, a new church of the Holy Sepulcher was, uh, was in place. The Crusades would briefly improve uh, the lot of Holy Land Christians, um, but the positive interlude that they might have provided um, was temporary, tenuous, and indeed very, very costly. Uh, the Crusades, however one wishes to, uh, to describe them, to define them, especially today from a post-colonialist perspective, deeming them a rapacious Western intrusion um, into an otherwise gentle, faultless East, the Crusades were above all an act of love, an act of devotion, and mainly an act of self-defense. It was delayed, it was 500 years late, uh, but it was an act of defense. It was an attempt at taking by force from interlopers what those interlopers had wrested by force. Um, it was ultimately um, unsuccessful. It did not restitute uh, Christian lands to Christians. But the Crusades were able, for a time, to establish, for the first time in more than 400 years, to establish a Christian principality or a series of principalities, but mainly, for our purposes, in the Holy Land, a Christian principality in uh, the Galilee, which also entailed the improvement uh, in the lot of uh, the Holy Land Christians. For a time, the Crusaders' departure in uh, 1291 uh, proved disastrous to what had remained uh, of the Holy Land Christians and uh, Eastern Christendom. By the end of the 13th century, the Mamluks had become the masters of the Holy Land, as former slaves, composed in the main of Turks and Circassians, and former Christians, or Islamized Christians, the Mamluks brought with them a particular brand of fanaticism and chauvinism and intolerance that perhaps only neophytes can, can muster, showing themselves to be particularly violent and cruel vis-a-vis -vis their Christian subjects, exacting reprisals, especially against those uh, Christians that cooperated with uh, the Crusaders. Uh, the Ottoman Muslim period, which uh, followed the Mamluks, roughly from 1515, 1516 to 1918, uh, was likewise a period of ebbs and flows for 
the uh, Christians of the Holy Land. At different periods of uh, their reign, uh, the Ottomans betrayed some uh, resignation in the polyglot nature of their uh, empire um, and did seek to manage that uh, diversity rather than crush it. But um, by that time, by the time the Ottomans came, uh, the Christian population of the Holy Land had become so impoverished in its numbers, so exiguous, uh, that it had lost all significance culturally, socially, and numerically speaking. Now, with the dismantlement of uh, the Ottoman Empire in 1918, the British inherited what the Ottomans had left, and that is the millet system. And the millet system recognized each Christian community, or at least each group of Christian communities, as distinct uh, nations. Um, so the British kept the millet system uh, almost intact and made it as the governing uh, basis of the mandate regime, and they ceded it in 1948 to Jordan. Okay, 1948 witnesses the establishment of the 1947, the, the UN decision to, to divide British Mandate Palestine into an Arab state and a Jewish state. No Arab state was founded, a Jewish state was founded, it was called Israel. Uh, so the area that was allotted initially to an Arab state would devolve onto uh, what we know today as Jordan. So the, the West Bank would go to Jordan, Gaza would go uh, to, uh, to Egypt. Um, so once more, uh, the ruling of those Christians who did not fall within Israel proper would be uh, under an yet another Muslim jurisdiction. So you had a 30-year interlude under the British where again the Christians begin breathing a sigh of relief um, only to have their hopes uh, crushed. But, but during that period, the 30 years of the British mandate, um, 80% of Holy Land Christians had become urbanized. More than 90% of their kids w had schooling. I mean, Im imagine the number, 90% in a country, in, in, a, in a place today, the Eastern Mediterranean, where illiteracy hovers at 50%. Those are amazing numbers. 90% um, receiving formal uh, education the community had, uh, had become a veritable conduit uh, uh, between East and West, contributing to the modernization, secularization, and all-around cultural uh, reawakening of what might have otherwise remained a, uh, um, an essentially Muslim backwater. With the 1948 establishment of the State of Israel as a home for the Jewish people, but a state with um, institutionalized freedom and equality for all citizens, regardless of religion, ethnicity, or, or gender. Uh, the Christians took part in the Israeli electoral process. Um, many served as members of the Israeli Knesset, uh, the Israeli Defense Forces, the Israeli Justice System, uh, the Israeli Diplomatic Corps. Indeed, non-Orthodox Christian, and there's a reason for that, we can talk about it later if you wish, non-Orthodox Christians of Israel proper took kindly to uh, the Jewish state, preaching acceptance and allegiance. Um, I'm going to read you a little excerpt from a, uh, a Melkite uh, villager explaining to his children what was, he had seven children explaining to them what was going to happen post-1947. And this is the narrative of an eight-year-old boy listening to his father, writing later after his recollections. So, in Europe began the explanation of this Melkite uh, head of the family. Um, in Europe, there's a man called Hitler, a Satan. This is a quote. For a long time, he was killing Jewish people, men, women, grandparents, even boys and girls like you. He killed them just because they were Jews, for no other reason. Now this Hitler is dead, but our Jewish brothers have been badly hurt and frightened. They can't go back to their homes, and they have not been welcomed by the rest of the world. So they are coming here to look for a home. In a few days, Jewish soldiers will be traveling through Bidam. Bidam is a, a, a town between, Le between Lebanon and Israel. 
today. Okay, but it's it's a ghost town today. So Jewish soldiers will be traveling through Biram. They are called Zionists. A few will stay in each home, and some will stay right here with us for a few days, maybe a week. They will move on. They have machine guns, but they don't kill. You have no reason to be afraid. We must be especially kind and make them feel at home. We are going to prepare a feast for them. This year, we'll celebrate the resurrection feast early. We will celebrate it for our Jewish brothers who were threatened with death and who are alive, end quote. Now, watching the excitement on his kids' faces as he was telling the story, and this is his son explaining this, um, the father asked his family to join him in, in his sort of extemporaneous rendition of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, Father in heaven, he prayed, help us show love to our Jewish brothers. Help us to show them peace, to quiet their troubled hearts. And as described by the this, this son who, who recorded this later on, the prayer that his father prayed with them, he couldn't remember all of it, felt to this eight-year-old at the time, uh, as if rising into the night sky, this is a quote, rising into the night sky like the smoking tendrils of incense that was burned at church. Now those were lyrical recollections maybe, um, but clearly recollections of a child yet untainted by uh, what would come later, the, 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 the foul stench of the Arab-Israeli conflict but they were also symptomatic of something that was going on at the time. They were symptomatic of anxieties that the parents were having, uh, representative of sensitivities of Holy Land uh, Christians. By no means all Holy Land Christians. Remember, there are 25 different denominations. Uh, but many Holy Land Christians who were distressed at the thought of being faced once more with the prospects of bondage to yet another Muslim government, falling prey to uh, other more modern forms of Muslim strictures that might have emerged out of the smoldering embers of the British mandate. But the status of Christians of the state uh, of Israel um, and the, the state of Jewish-Christian relations uh, in Israel today remain uh, uh, tenuous, uh, crippled by the intransigence of, and, uh, of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Yet most Israeli Christians persevere in their attempts at acting as, uh, as a bridge between two worlds, between Israel and the Arab world, between the East uh, and the West, and they, they try to, uh, to alleviate uh, the the resentments and uh, the, the mistrust. Ironically, its warts and blemishes uh, notwithstanding, Israel remains the safest haven for Near Eastern Christians today. You speak to Christians in Israel today, they're not ready, regardless of where they come from, they need to know you first of all, they need to know who they're speaking with because there's, there's this caginess also about them. So, so not anyone can be a pollster and go take polls among Christians. Uh, they don't speak very easily. Um, but Israel remains, you get this out of them, it remains the safest haven. Uh, they wouldn't want to pick up and go live in Gaza or in the Palestinian, in, in the West Bank. Um, and incidentally, Israel is the only Middle Eastern country since its founding that witnessed a sizable growth in its the numbers of its Christians, whereas the numbers dwindled elsewhere. Um, in fact, Christian integration is stronger than emigration in Israel, and the challenges that Christians may face in the Jewish state are a far cry from the existential dangers staring their co-religionists uh, under the Palestinian Authority and elsewhere in the Near East. Conversely, unlike the situation of Israel's Christians, which is by no means a, a, an enviable or a perfect one, the indigenous Christians of the Palestinian Authority have since 1993 been stuck in a religious and social ghetto, opting to vote with their feet, meaning choosing emigration over integration, 
uh, within a integration within a Palestinian uh, society that they deem increasingly corrupt and inefficient and intolerant. The Christians' ability to obtain uh, uh, justice is possible within Israel. It is not possible within the Palestinian territory. Uh, a system that is openly uh, Islamized, bereft of uh, institutional organization. Um, faced with daily offenses, this is the Palestinian territories, uh, ranging from uh, defacement of institutions to public displays of contempt to intimidation, extortion, pressure to abide by um, Islamic law, Palestinian Authority Christians uh, may b indeed be on the verge of extinction. Uh, the numbers issuing from uh, Bethlehem are, are uh, quite telling, and Bethlehem is used uh, um, on purpose because it's, it's an extreme uh, example, but uh, it tells you a lot. Uh, approaching 90%, 90% of the Christian population uh, through the 1960s, the Christians of Bethlehem today have been reduced to barely 30%. Uh, this is according to recent estimates. There are no, there are no actual uh, censuses taken. But that figure may indeed be a little inflated, the uh, 30%. Uh, this is coming from uh, Bethlehemites uh, themselves. Um, it's not scientific. This is based on personal conversations. Um, so they are cagey. Um, they're not ready with uh, given information, they're not ready with expressing uh, their dismay uh, or their criticism of their Muslim neighbors, uh, and they fear, they fear retribution, um, they fear accusations of, of treason, uh, should they say something that uh, may sound untoward. Yet, based on Israeli documentation, and naturally this Israeli documentation is not corroborated by Palestinian sources, things are gloomier than most Christians under the PA may let on. An anecdote symptomatic uh, of their apprehensions uh, alleges that on the heels of the Six-Day War, some 550 uh, Christian elders from Bethlehem lobbied Israeli Prime Minister then Levi Eshkol, lobbied his uh, government um, and, and signed a petition um, asking the government of Israel to annex Bethlehem to Jerusalem so that, quote, so that both Christian holy sites, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and the Church of the Nativity may be under one nationality. Israel, of course, denied that request, uh, but this was 1967. No Christian within the PA today, the Palestinian Authority, would dare pull a stunt like that. Um, and so the show still goes on. The show still goes wrong. I read this on a, uh, an announcement here on the street today. Um, and Holy Land Christians continue uh, shuffling down the path of disintegration quietly under the silent gaze of the world. But this is not a modern phenomenon. For centuries, the Middle East, uh, the Middle East cross uh, has got trampled in the dust of the other children of Abraham, the descendants of his first son, Ishmael. In quiet desperation, Millennial Christian quarters have disappeared. Old neighborhoods have counted their dead. Desiccated clergy gave last rites, and panic gripped those precious few left behind. But the plight of near recent Christians does not uh, make for catchy headlines. It's not even worthy of second, third, or even last page news. There is a fatigue uh, about the Middle East in general, so the Christians are uh, or their plight is completely uh, sometimes reported in the United States at least as if you're giving a weather report. So uh, something you do every day, so not worth um, lingering on. Uh, but there is clearly a, a hierarchy in reporting uh, the news uh, in the Middle East. Um, some media treatment of uh, Near Eastern Christians is, is almost non extent. Um,
I'm not trying to cast an accusatory finger on the West or the way the West uh, reports on Near Eastern Christians. Uh, the onus is also on non-Christians in the Middle East to say something. If you see something, say something. And very few dare raise their voices. The few ones who raise their voices are quickly marginalized. Uh, I would like to read you a quote from um, uh, Ahmad al-Sarraf, a, a Kuwaiti uh, a journalist um, who, who decided to speak up after July 2014, and he published this, this uh, combustive uh, indictment of the crimes being committed in the name of his people, his faith, he's, uh, he's a Muslim, uh, crimes being committed against the battered Christians uh, of the Near East. And he titled this editorial, Be Gone, Christians. Uh, it's a tongue-in-cheek, uh, he didn't mean it, uh, but it, it's a statement on, on the apathy not only of the world, but the apathy of uh, Middle Eastern, non-Christian, non-minority Middle Eastern, me meaning Muslim Middle Easterners. So he said, yes, be gone already, Christians, and take with you, quote, take with you the mercy of your pacifist creed, because with al-Nusra and ISIS and al-Qaeda and the rest of them on our side, with the gangs of Muslim brothers and their latest, finest products, we are scarcely in need of the Christian's mercy and compassion. Let the bloodletting commence. Let the violence reign supreme. Let the hearts get ripped out of their chest cavities. And let the human livers get eaten raw. Let the tongues get torn out. Let the necks get hacked off. And let the knees get shattered. For we shall eagerly return to the medicine of old, to our herbal remedies and our old musty books of alchemy and witchcraft. Yes, be gone, Christians, and leave us be to our desert creed. For we crave the glint of our swords, the heat of our sands, and the energy of our mules. We scarcely need you, your civilization, or your scientific and literary contributions, for we have our own capital in abundance, our own gangs of murderers and bloodthirsty butchers and executioners. Scram, you Christians, and spare us your civilization already. We are replacing you and your culture with that of the grave diggers, end quote. I beg your mercy for another 10 minutes because I would like to conclude with a large quote this time, uh, but it was very similar to this one, but it was written 85 years ago, okay? Uh, and uh, it is a statement, I, I chose to end with it because I, th I think it's a, it's a very eloquent statement on, on apathy. Okay, and I think this is what we're dealing with. There's, there, there's failure of policy, yes. There's failure of understanding. There's failure of interpretation. And that's why I dwelt a little longer on issues of language and how to call things in places and peoples. But there's an issue of apathy. Um, and an issue of apathy very similar to Niemöller's uh, 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 statement on, on, on the crimes of Nazi Germany. You know, first they came for the communists, but I wasn't a communist, so I didn't say anything. Um, the statement that I'm going to read for you is from 1933. It was written on the heels of the Assyrian genocide in, 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 in Iraq, and it was written in English by Armenian-American uh, novelist um, William Saroyan, um, 70,000 Assyrians, it's titled, um, was a decent man's um, refusal to commit the aggrieved uh, uh, Eastern Christians to oblivion. Uh, it was, of course, not written with today's events in mind, but as you, if you listen to it, you, you will see that uh, it was almost, uh, almost prophetic. Um, in this tale, Saroyan begins by telling us uh, how uh, it's been ages since he's had a haircut and how he's beginning to look seedy and unkempt. Uh, he says, in quote, like several violinists out of work and ready to join the Communist Party. Uh, we, barbarian, we barbarians from Asia Minor, presumably people who look like me, we barbarians from Asia Minor, he wrote, are hairy people. And when we need a haircut, 
we really need a haircut. So he goes to the San Francisco Barber's College for a 15 cent haircut. Those of you who are social historians will appreciate this. For a 15 cent haircut, and he lands himself a new apprentice. And here's what happens next. Entirely, it's a quote. The young man who gave me the haircut was tall. He had a dark, serious face, thick lips, on the verge of smiling, but melancholy, thick eyelashes, sad eyes, a large nose. I saw his name on the card that was pasted on the mirror. Theodore Bedal, it said. A good name, genuine. A good young man, genuine. Theodore Bedal began to work on my head. A good barber never speaks before he's spoken to, no matter how full his heart is. That name, I said, Badal, are you an Armenian? You see, I'm an Armenian. I've mentioned this before. People look at me and begin to wonder. So I come right out and tell them, I'm an Armenian, I say. Or they read something I might have written and they begin to wonder. So I let them know, I'm an Armenian, I say. It's a meaningless thing, meaningless remark. But they expect me to say it, so I do. I have no idea what it's like to be an Armenian or what it's like to be an Englishman or a Japanese or anything else for that matter. I have a faint idea what it's like to be alive. This is the only thing that interests me greatly. This and tennis. Square bracket. He's sarcastic on a purpose, on purpose, okay? Uh, so this and tennis. I hope someday to write a great philosophical work on tennis, something on the order of death in the afternoon. But I'm aware I'm not yet ready to undertake such a project. Now, it may seem to some sophisticated people that I'm trying to make fun of Hemingway. I'm not. Death in the afternoon is a pretty sound piece of prose. Even when Hemingway is a fool, He's at least an accurate fool. So, are you an Armenian, I asked? We're a small people. And whenever one of us meets another, it's an event. We're always looking around for someone to talk to in our language. Our most ambitious political party estimates that there are nearly two million of us living on Earth. But most of us don't think so. Most of us sit down, take a pencil and a piece of paper, and we take one section of the world at a time and imagine how many Armenians uh, at the most are likely to be living in that section and we put the highest number on the paper and then we go on to another section, India, Russia, Soviet Armenia, Egypt, Italy, Lebanon, Germany, France, North America, South America, Australia, and so on and on. And after we add up our most hopeful figures, the total comes to something a little less than a million. Then we start to think how big our families are, how high our birth rate and how low our death rate, except in times of war when massacres increase the death rate. And we begin to imagine how rapidly we will increase if we are left alone even for a quarter century. And we feel pretty happy. I remember the Near East relief drives in my hometown. My uncle used to be our orator. And he used to make a whole auditorium full of Armenians weep. He was an attorney and he was a great orator. Well, at first, the trouble was war. Our people were being destroyed by the enemy. Those who hadn't been killed were homeless and they were starving. Our flesh and blood, my uncle used to say, and we'd all weep. And we'd gather money and send it out to our people in the old country. Then after the war, when I was a bigger boy, we had another Near East relief drive. And my uncle stood on the stage of the civic auditorium of my hometown and said, thank God this time it was not the enemy, but an earthquake. God has made us suffer. We have worshipped him through trial and tribulation, through suffering and disease and torture and horror. And my uncle began to weep. He began to sob. 
We've worshipped him through the madness of despair. And now he has done this thing to us. And still we worship him. Still we praise him. We don't understand the ways of God. Now after the drive, I went to my uncle and I said, Did you mean what you said about God? And he said, That was oratory, son. We've got to raise money. What God? God is nonsense. And when you cried, I asked. And my uncle said, That was real. I couldn't help it. I had to cry. Why? For God's sake, why must we go through all this goddamn hell? What have we done to deserve all this torture? Man won't let us alone. God won't let us alone. Have we done something wrong? Aren't we supposed to be a pious people? What is our sin? I'm disgusted with God and I'm sick of man. The only reason I'm willing to get up and talk is that I don't dare keep my mouth shut anymore. I can't bear the thought of more of our people dying. Jesus Christ, have we done something wrong? So I asked Theodore Badal, are you an Armenian? He said, I'm an Assyrian. Well, that is something. They, the Assyrians, came from our part of the world. They had noses like our noses, eyes like our eyes, hearts like our hearts. They had a different language. When they spoke, we didn't understand them, but they were a lot like us. It wasn't quite as pleasing as it would have been had Badal been an Armenian, but that was really something, an Assyrian. I'm an Armenian, I said. <laughs> I used to know some Ar Armenian uh, Assyrian boys in my hometown. Joseph Sarkis, Nito Elia, Tony Saleh. Do you know any of them? Joseph Sarkis, I know him, said Badal. The others I don't. We lived in New York until just five years ago. Uh, then we came out west to Turlock, and then we moved up to San Francisco. We began to talk about the Assyrian language and the Armenian language, about the old world conditions over there, and so on. I was getting a 15 cent haircut, and I was doing my best to learn something at the same time, to acquire some new truth, some new appreciation of the wonder of life, the dignity of man. Man has great dignity, you know. Do not imagine that he does not. Badal said, I can't read Assyrian. I was born in the old country, but I want to get over it. He sounded tired, not physically, but spiritually. Why, I said, why do you want to get over it? Well, he laughed, simply because everything is washed up over there. Now, I'm repeating his words precisely, putting nothing of my own. We were a great people once, he went on, but that was yesterday, the day before yesterday. Now we're a topic in ancient history. We had a great civilization, they're still admiring it. Now I'm in America, learning how to cut hair. We're washed up as a race, we're through, it's all over. Why should I learn to read the language? We have no writers, we have no news. Well, there's a little news, once in a while the English encouraged the Arabs to slaughter us, and that's that, it's an old story. We know it all too well. The news comes to us through the Associated Press. Anyway, these remarks were very painful to me in Armenian. I had always felt badly about my own people being destroyed. I had never heard an Assyrian speaking in English about such things. I felt great love for this young fellow. Now, don't get me wrong, <laughs> there's a tendency these days to think in terms of pansies whenever a man says that he has affection for a man. I think now I have affection for all people, even for the enemies of Armenia, whom I have so tactfully not named here. Everyone knows who they are. I have nothing against any of them because I think of them as one man living one life at a time. And I know, I am positive that one man at a time is incapable of the monstrosities of the mobs. My objection is to mobs only. Well, I said, it's much the same with us. We too are old. We still have our church. We still have a few writers, Aharonian, Ishakian, a few others. But it's much the same, like you. Yes, said the barber, I know. We went in for the wrong things. 
We went in for the simple things, peace and quiet and families. We didn't go in for machinery and conquest and militarism. We didn't go in for diplomacy and deceit and the invention of machine guns and poison gases. Oh, well, there's no use being disappointed. We had our day, I suppose. We are hopeful, I said. There is no Armenian living who doesn't still dream of an independent Armenia. Dream, said Badal. Well, that is something, man. Assyrians can't even dream anymore. Why, do you know how many of us are left on earth? I don't know, two, three million? 70,000, said Badal. That's all. 70,000 Assyrians in the world. And the Arabs are still killing us. They killed 70 of us in a little uprising last month. There was a small paragraph in it in the paper. 70 more of us destroyed. We'll be wiped out before too, too long. My brother is married to an American girl. He has a son. There's no more hope. We're trying to forget Assyria. My father still reads an Assyrian paper that comes to him from New York, but he's an old man. He will be dead soon. Then his voice changed. He ceased speaking as an Assyrian, and he began to speak as a barber. Have I taken enough off the top, he asked. The rest of the story is pointless. I said so long to the young Assyrian, and I left the shop. I thought about this whole business, Assyria and the Assyrian people, Theodore Badal, learning to be a barber, the sadness of his voice, the hopelessness of his attitude. This was months ago, in August, but ever since I've been thinking about Assyria, and I've been wanting to say something about Theodore Badal, a son of an ancient race, himself youthful and alert, yet hopeless. 70,000 Assyrians, a mere 70,000 of that great people, and all the others quiet and deaf, and all the greatness crumbled and ignored, and a young man in America learning to be a barber, and a young man lamenting bitterly the course of history. I'm thinking of 70,000 Assyrians, one at a time, alive, a great race, and I'm thinking of Theodore Badal himself, 70,000 Assyrians, and 70 million Assyrians, himself, Assyria, and man, standing in a barber shop in San Francisco in 1933, and being himself still the whole Assyrian race. Thank you.